Okay, so today we're going to talk about the difference between the object and the object reference variable. So I've created this demo that you'll be able to look at later, um, but this, uh, this demo that I'm doing here explains difference, differences between, okay, and then these are the things we're going to be doing. Things called primitive variables. objects and object reference variables. Object. Okay. So let's start with where we were before, what, what we know. So primitive variables are things like the int, double, and the boolean. Okay. Now, in the past, we just called them variables, right? That's all we called them. And remember this from last year? Okay. So, yeah, last year I said, oh, uh, let's create a variable called a, and we'll put them, which will be an int, and we'll put the number one in it, and lo and behold, look at, there it is. You know, the one is inside here. Okay? And we did that with all the different types. And the, the concept of a shoebox for a primitive variable is really good because, check this out, if this is, if this spreadsheet represents RAM, Okay, then every single location that we have in RAM has the ability to have something in it. And when you store, when you run this program, like right now, I run this program, even though it's not showing anything, here we go, I'm gonna run this one. What just happened is these three variables just got assigned a space in RAM, and the values that they were given were assigned right to them. For example, it would look like this in memory. A is one, B is 5.6, and C is true, okay? The key is that the value is stored in the same place as the variable name. This way, if I go do a system.out.println a, the computer comes along to it and it says, oh, I'm gonna look for a, it looks for a, it finds the one, and then it prints the one. Okay, and that's how our understanding of variables should be at this point. That's what it does, it's stored in the memory. Now, objects are not stored like that. Okay, so let me explain. So now, this is objects versus object object references. Now, I uh, added the flashcard class to our thing here, so I'm gonna be able to have both of these here. So I'm actually gonna swap these two to the visible on the thing. So, all right, so we all remember that a flashcard had these four things, these four properties. Those are the instance variables, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna make a flashcard. So flashcard, I'll just call it F equals new flashcard. Okay. Something that we're all familiar with doing, right? Now let me explain how the computer actually handles this. And this is the kind of the computer science part of, of the lesson. So 
The first thing is that this part right here says create a flashcard reference. Okay, F is a variable and it can store a flashcard reference. Here's what that means. This part right here, the computer, when you run this program, the computer assigns a space. So it looks in memory and it looks for a space where there's an open spot. And it says, okay, F, it has a space. Okay. So it finds a location, an, an address, is what we call it, in the computer memory. And that's what this part does. Okay. This is the fun part. This side right here okay, creates the flashcard object. Right? New statement. And remember this, this is the empty constructor. That's why these two look exactly the same. Is because when we do this new flashcard, this is actually calling this piece of code right here to generate the flashcard, the generic flashcard. Okay. This part right here creates the object. And what happens here is over on the side, there is space that's allocated for an, a flashcard object. So this is a flashcard object. Okay. And within the flashcard object, there are four things. There are, there's the topic. There's the question, there's the answer, and the is known. And when we create a brand new generic flashcard object, these all get the default values. And the default for a Boolean is false. Now, this is, this is the amazing part. It's really kind of cool. Picture this as a very large parking lot. You ever been to Disney World or a place that has a really super big parking lot? And then how do they label them? Label each spot. Symbols or numbers or colors or whatever. You know, you might go to uh, Disney World or would it be Disney World, Pixar. Pixar doesn't have a thing. They would have like Ariel 15G, you know, and that's your location. Okay. Well, your computer RAM, so these computers all have 4 gig of RAM, so that means that there's kind of think of it is there's four gigs of parking spots that are available okay each of these locations their addresses so this guy has an address of where it is every place has an address of where that where it is so let's I'll just make one up here because it'd be impossible to actually do this so let's call it 3C5. Let's see, because we're it's, it's going to be represented in the hexadecimal. Okay, so this is the address, and this address is like where this thing first starts. So this is like my car, and my car is parked at this address. And this address is just a location. Actually, you know what I could do? Watch this. E6. This 
see that? E6 is using the column in the row for this particular spreadsheet. So where is this where is this object located? Well, its address is E6. But in the computer memory, it's just gigantic. It's a huge spreadsheet. This is the really fun part. The variable f does not store the object. It stores the address in memory of where the object lives. So that means that E6 is what f stores. Okay. So back to here. If I now do a little thing with f and I say f dot <coughs> set topic to cs, okay, and I click run, this is the part that I need you to understand how what, what's, what the order is. You're telling the program when it runs, okay, f go set the topic. So the computer comes over in memory and it, it finds F. And it says, F, oh, you're a flashcard object reference. You hold an address of an object. So go to the E6 and change the topic to CS. Up to this point, we've called f the object, right? And I only did that at the beginning just because it's easier to say, oh, let's create an object, let's call it that. But it's wrong to call f the object. It's a really an object reference. Because it doesn't hold the object itself, it holds the address of the object because the object is actually kind of just someplace else. It references the object. It references the object. Okay. So this is what we can do. And then if I say system.out.print, and I say f dot uh, get topic, and I run it. The important thing to note is that it says, okay, go find F. F is a reference to E6, which is the address of the object. It finds E6 in the whole memory map, and then it allows it to get the topic. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, when you think about it this way, this is how we would be allowed to do this. Flashcard G. Is there a compiler error? No. I can run it. Still just prints the topic. Okay. What do you suppose I'm going to get if I print out G? Right now, G was created. And she was getting the error. So you can go and make the object so the object doesn't have an address. Okay. So we go and run. If I hover over it, you can tell you can see that it's actually yelling at us. It doesn't allow us to because it's got a compile error. It says, hey, you need to initialize this variable. Okay. Now, the point that I'm making here is that these two things don't have to happen in the same line. This part right here 
creates a reference variable. This part here creates the object. And when I run it, it says, this is exactly what happens now. Line 20, flashcard G. Okay, here we go. Flashcard G, the computer finds another space. They don't always end up next to each other. And this is another flashcard object. And it's got a topic and a question and an answer and it is known. And no, 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 false. Okay. <coughs> What's the address of this flashcard? F11. F11. So the address of this one is F11. Line 20 created a flashcard reference, but didn't put anything in it. Line 21 says, okay, I'm going to make a new flashcard. Object and G is going to point to it, is what we call it also. So it's a reference to it. And then now I printed G, and G, when I printed it, it said null, 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 false. What is this? Anybody remember what we did? Two it was a two string. We overrode the two string. And so it prints out the values because it says go to G. And then G says go to F11. F11. And then that's where the object is and it prints the values. Does that make sense? Okay. Now I'm going to throw something really weird at you. card G. Oops. E-F-G-H. Look at line 25. H equals F. Wouldn't that just be setting the reference to the same thing? Mm -hmm. So, flashcard H, what happens there? It says, make me a space that can hold uh, a flashcard reference. And that this is line 24. Line 25, so this is why it's important to know the order. We always take the left side, the right side, and, and assign it to the left side. So whatever's on the right goes in there. So H takes on the value of F, which means this is also E6. What this means is this object, reference variable, points to the same object as this reference. They both point to the same object. What I want you to see here is that the object reference variables and the objects are two different things. So watch this. When I say this and I say system dot out dot print line H get topic. What's it going to print? Yes. It's going to print CS. <coughs> and the reason why it prints CS is because H and F hold the same reference, the same address, so they're both pointing to the same object. 
which means this, H has the ability to, cha to change the object. H dot set topic to, huh? And then let's print it. And let's print, watch this. H and F are pointing to the same place. H gets a topic, print CS. H gets to change the topic. And then if we print it using F, F results in the change. Because what H did when it set the topic is it changed this to huh. And that means F and G will be if you get the topic, they both will get the same topic. Make sense? The object is separate from the object reference. Okay, now watch this. What if I say F equals no? click on run. What did that just do? Hmm? Nope. It set F subdirects to no. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't reference the other object. Does this impact the object? No. Look at all it does is it says Hey, you used to be E6, okay, now you are null, which means that F no longer knows where object, where this object is. Does that make sense? So, by assigning a value to null, we lose that reference. Oops, wrong one. Okay, now what? So F got assigned null, which means it does not hold the address anymore. H got assigned a null, which means that E6 got erased there, so it does not know where this object is. So now it's just kind of floating around. Right. That's a good way to say it. This object still exists, but it's nobody knows where it lives. And so, and you can't say, oh, get me that object, because we don't know where it is, and the object does not have a name. It's not called F. F is not the name of the object. F and H were just holding the address of where that object is. So, if you run a program like this, and you set all the references to the object equal to null, what happens is this, this will just be sitting out there in memory until the garbage collector comes along. The garbage collector is a feature of Java that is running in the background. Okay, and what it does, it sort of scours the memory for abandoned objects. 
And if it sees it, and it knows that nobody knows where it lives, then it erases this memory so it's available for use by something else. Does that make sense? Okay, the concept here is all explained in concept two, and I hopefully as you, now if you reread it or you read it for the first time, what I'm trying to make there makes sense. Okay, we're gonna do one last one. I'm gonna reset these to what they were before. And so F is still gonna to point to E6. And G is going to point to F11. Okay. And here's the final channel. Yes. Is there any way you can like dig ball and run it on the object or no? Not that I know of. Yeah. There may be. But um, the problem is, it would you would have to remember where it was because mm -hmm. they don't have a name. They're just objects that are sitting out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there like any reason you would want to do that in the right in the program? Yeah, because sometimes if you're if you're let's suppose you're generating and regenerating a lot of objects, or you're playing it. Let's play, pretend you're playing a game. You're playing the narwhal. Game. And is there ever a point where there's an object and then you like kill it and it goes away? Right? <laughs> I don't know what the name of it is. <laughs> so picture a game where objects go away. If you don't at that at that point you're really setting the references to null. So that they don't exist anymore in the world. And if you had a lot of objects and you played this game for a really long time on the same computer, then, you know, in theory, your memory would fill up. Okay. All right, here's the final challenge. F knows where this object lives, and G knows where this object is. What I want to do is I want to have them swap. In other words, I want F to have the address of the purple one, and I want G to have the reference of the red object. Think about that for a moment. Take this away. Is H still or did H not have to be by the end of the record? Um hang on one second. Uh, H is still out there. Yes. Okay. Now, because I'm a computer science main writer, I know how to do this. So I'm going to let F equals G, and then I'm going to let G equals F. And that's going to swap them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I'm really smart, and that looks really right. It does look right, but it's not right. OK? <laughs> so let's just walk through this in, because that is incorrect. But it's beginning programmers think that that would work, and it just seems like it would. So let's do it. Line 31, F takes on the value of G. So F takes on the value of G. This one gets F11. Okay. Line 32, G takes on the value of F. F11. <laughs> and so F11, what it actually does is it destroys this and it replaces it with F11. It doesn't recognize that it's the same thing. Okay. So that didn't work because they're both pointing to the wrong to one of them. Okay? Alright, so somebody tell me, Eric, you were the first one to put your hand up. You have to set uh, H equal to F and then G equal to F and then F equal to H. Okay, say H equals F. H equals F and then G equals F or G equals 
Yeah, G equals F and then F equals H. Okay, let's run through this and see how it works. So E6 and F11. Okay, H equals F. So this one gets E6. G equals F, so G equals F. Or, oh, sorry, I switched. I switched two of them around in my head. Yeah. That doesn't work. So what do I need? F equals G. Yeah. F okay. equals G. Right here, it's F equals G. And then what's what on that one? B equals B. This is correct right here. Yeah. So if you want to copy that down, you can. It, this is something I did for the second Euler project. Oh, yeah. yeah. F, G, and H. So this is E6. This is F11. So, so just to make sure we know what's going on. So H takes on the value of F, which is E6. F takes on the value of G which is F11, and then G takes on the value of H, which is E6. And then now they have successfully swapped who they are pointing to. Did you really swap two variables at the same time without going into like the third variable? Mm -hmm. um, in my, I first learned this swap routine in 1982. I was a freshman in college. It still hasn't changed. And it still hasn't changed. And my computer science professor described it like this. He said, all right, here's the problem. I got a watermelon in this hand, and I got a watermelon in this hand. <laughs> and they're, each of them are so big that I can't put two in one. He says, so how do we swap them? <laughs> so, perfect idea. You take one, you throw it up in the air, then you click swap, and then you land the last one. Okay? The deal is the sky is the extra variable. You always need the extra variable. I've heard of other ones where you set one down, you know, then you swap and then you pick it up. Same thing. <laughs> now, if you're ever unsure on whether or not you've written swap code, because you're going to have to be able to read and write swap code, um, this is how you can swap integers, doubles. At least it's the formula for everything for swapping. It's the transitive property. Listen. Yeah. that so if you were to string them each together H to F to G to H okay so it looks exactly like the transitive property that you would that you learned in math okay except when we do computer science the equals means something different than it does in math it's an assignment statement all right, so the summary of today, the big concept is that primitive variables, which we learned in CS2, those values are stored in the same exact place as where the variable name is. Those are called primitives. And it's everything that starts with a lowercase. Int, double, and boolean, long, and long, and float. Short. And short. And byte. And byte. <laughs> and char. What about string? <coughs> Strings are different. That's why it's got an uppercase S. Mm -hmm. Anything in which there's an object that's created, which is really strings create an object, then that means that that variable name 
does not hold the object, it just holds a reference to the object. And when we say new and then call the constructor, that's where it creates an object, but the two are not tied together. They're only tied together and if the reference variable holds the address of it. Make it a little bit more clear. Okay, it's a uh, it's a really cool design and concept, and it's um, so it's just something that you're going to have to know throughout the year because there's going to be some code you're going to read where we're doing some stuff like this and you have to recognize what's going on. Okay. Plus, I think sometimes it'll make more sense now when you try to do something. You'll be like. Okay, that makes sense because this is what's happening behind it. Okay, that's it for today. Nothing.